In this video, we will learn about electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, or EAS reactions. Uh, first, we'll talk about why aromatic compounds undergo reactions differently from those that you have learned in the past when it comes to electrophilic addition to alkenes. So just to remind us, if you take a molecule like cyclohexene and react it with an electrophile, bromine in this case, um, you end up doing overall an, an addition to the alkene. So here we make a vicinal dibromide. If we do the exact same reaction using benzene as the nucleophile, what we find is that actually benzene does not react with Br2 to a significant extent. And so we consider this as a case where there's just no reaction taking place. This tells us right away that carbon-carbon double bonds in aromatic molecules like benzene are different from those in just regular alkenes. If we look at the reaction, it's helpful to just consider what is actually happening. So going back to electrophilic addition to an alkene, the reaction looks like this. We have an addition to an electrophile, attack back, and a leaving group leaving, getting us to the bromonium ion intermediate that then is attacked and ring open to get us to product. If we're trying to do the exact same thing with benzene now, we should anticipate a similar or analogous process. Uh, but this doesn't happen, so that's why I'm using a dashed arrow. But if we were to try to imagine it happening, it would look something like this. One thing to note here is I did not show a bromonium ion here because there is potential for a lot of resonance delocalization. Although this reaction does not take place for the bromination of benzene using these reaction conditions, this is the type of process that EAS reactions undergo. And what we form in the intermediate stage is this type of an ion where we've lost the aromaticity at the beginning that was there at the beginning and made what's called an arenium ion intermediate where the word arenium is coming from the fact that there's people who use the word arene to refer to aromatic molecules. So let's take a closer look at this process. So I think it's helpful to go back to a reaction coordinate diagram just to help understand this a little bit further. Again, our aromatic carbon-carbon double bonds are less nucleophilic and less reactive because they are much more stabilized and thus lower in energy. What that means is in an energy diagram is that our starting reactants, so benzene and Br2, overall should be lower in energy than our reactants cyclohexane and bromine. So that's that difference in energy from the starting point. If we're thinking about this reaction, we are forming an unstable intermediate. Right? This should be less stable than where we started from. Same thing in the case of the arenium. And so I will pull that up here as my two intermediate states for those two different reactions. Here you'll note that the arenium is shown as being lower in energy. And I've shown that just because there is so much resonance delocalization of charge. But it's important to see that the difference is that I'm starting at a higher energy. And what that means for the cyclohexane is that the transition state is going to be at overall easier to get to compared to when I try to make the arenium ion. So even if that transition state is a little bit lower in energy in red here, this is still a bigger mountain to climb. So here it's my starting point that's dictating the fact that I don't see much reactivity with benzene as a nucleophile. I see reactivity with cyclohexene as a nucleophile. A second difference between electrophilic addition to alkene reactions and EAS reactions is that the intermediate will undergo two different types of processes in these two types of reactions. So if we do get to an arenium ion intermediate in an EAS reaction, there is a huge driving force to restore the aromaticity that was lost initially upon addition. And so this is a very uphill process to break the aromaticity. should make sense that then it's a very downhill process to restore aromaticity. So I'm going to show you that for a different set of reactions here. So first in blue, I have the hydrobromination of an alkene. And if you recall, that involves first the protonation of the alkene, and then eventually the second step has the nucleophile attacking the carbocation directly. Let's take a hypothetical EAS reaction here where I just have a generic electrophile E+. So same deal, a carbon-carbon double bond attacks the electrophile, getting us to the positively charged intermediate. At this point, however, if there is a nucleophile present, 
what's going to happen is that instead of attacking the positive charge directly, the nucleophile is much more likely to deprotonate and thus perform overall what's a beta elimination reaction, thus reforming the double bond that was part of the aromatic system. And so it is that reformation of aromaticity that leads aromatic molecules to undergo substitution reactions when they react with electrophiles, while regular alkenes tend to undergo addition reactions. And so the takeaway of all this is that if we want to add an electrophile to an aromatic system, we need a more reactive electrophile. So in my energy diagram here, if the problem is that this is too low in energy, then I need to do something to raise its energy. And of the two reactants, I'm definitely not changing the benzene ring because that's what I wanted to react as my nucleophile. So the only thing I can change is then my electrophile. The way this is done in practice is to use some sort of a catalyst to create an electrophile that's very electrophilic and very reactive. So now we're going to go through five different types of EAS reactions that have five different types of electrophiles. These are not the only types of EAS reactions that are known, but the way that these work serves as a template for essentially all the known types of EAS reactions. So a first very important type of reaction is sulfonation of aromatic rings. And this takes place by reacting an aromatic ring here. I'm going to use benzene for all these examples. So benzene reacting with a mixture of sulfuric acid and SO3 that gets you to this benzene sulfonic acid. Uh, one small thing to note here is that SO3 is actually a piece of sulfuric acid. So if you take water and add it to SO3, you get sulfuric acid. So any H2SO4 technically could be in equilibrium with H2O and SO3. So let's look at how this mechanism works. All EAS reactions are going to have the same type of mechanism where we first somehow make an electrophile, then we add to the carbon-carbon double bond, and finally we then eliminate to reform the carbon-carbon double bond. So on the first step for sulfonation, what we are doing is we are protonating the SO3 like this. That gets us to the actual electrophile here, and of course the conjugate base HSO4 minus. Once we have an electrophile, that can then react with the nucleophilic benzene. And that reaction will look like so, where we have the pi bond attacking. That's going to then push electron density up to the protonated oxygen in the sulfur trioxide. Overall, that gets me to the arenium intermediate. And it's helpful to uh, draw in the hydrogen atoms here, just to keep track of what's going on. Once we're at this stage, we have to remember that our goal is to reform the aromaticity. In other words, create a double bond here. Our electron sink is this positive charge. And so what that means is that we want to bring in the pair of electrons from here during our elimination process, which means that we need our conjugate base to come in and deprotonate that hydrogen to do so. And that's it. Again, there are three stages here. We have our electrophile formation, addition to the carbon-carbon double bond, and then beta elimination. The next reaction we'll look at is a nitration reaction in which an NO2 group or a nitro group is added to a benzene ring. This is an industrially extremely important reaction uh, because this is the easiest way to add nitrogen-containing functional groups to a molecule, so getting eventually to aryl amines. An example of this reaction would look like this. So benzene reacting with nitric acid and sulfuric acid makes nitrobenzene. The mechanism starts off like so. So nitric acid looks like this right here. We're actually going to protonate nitric acid. And what we're going to do is to actually protonate the OH group out here using the sulfuric acid. That gets us to something that looks like this. Um, if you're looking at this, you might ask right away, well, why don't I protonate something that has a negative charge on it? And the answer is that you can, and that might be happening. Um, so you might have some amount of um, H2NO3 where it's two OHs that are present. Um, but overall, for this mechanism, that doesn't do anything. It's the process that goes this way that actually leads to some change overall in the reaction mixture. So this is the one that we'll draw. Once we get to this stage here, then we have an H2O leaving group that's built in and essentially a collapsible trigonal planar intermediate. And so that's what happens. 
get that type of a collapse. After that collapse and water leaving, uh, then what we have left is an NO2 plus molecule or a nitronium ion, and that is our electrophile. One thing you should notice is that these electrophiles in our reactions are always basically just this group that is attached to the benzene ring after the reaction, but instead of being neutral, positively charged, right? So I can always look at the product of an EAS reaction, look at the group that's added, and take that out, so NO2, put a positive charge, that's my electrophile. So at the beginning of this video, we talked about how the bromination of benzene did not take place if we reacted benzene with Br2. Turns out you can achieve halogenation of benzene if you mix in to your reaction mixture a bit of Lewis acid catalyst. So for such a reaction, they always can take a form like this one here, where if I have benzene, I can react it with typically either Cl2 or Br2 to get to chlorinated or brominated products. And for the Lewis acid, it's almost always a trihalo metal type of a molecule. Most commonly, we're going to see iron trichloride or iron tribromide. And also we'll see aluminum trichloride or aluminum tribromide. Uh, for halogenations, it's more common to use the iron version of the reagent, of the Lewis acid. Uh, but many different Lewis acids will functionally do the same thing. And so let's look at what they do here. The key point is that we have the metal, which acts as a Lewis acid, and the halogen, which acts as a Lewis base. Over on this reaction, then, what we're getting is the addition of the X2 molecule directly to the metal. Uh, the metal is Lewis acidic, so it's accepting a pair of electrons. That gets to this crazy-looking adduct species here. This is the Lewis adduct. And that is the electrophile in the reaction. Once you have this adduct, then the nucleophile can attack the outer halogen here, the neutral one. That then allows the electron density from this sigma bond here get, to get pushed onto the electron sink here, getting us to a byproduct, which is the MX4 anion. Once we have the electrophile, then we can attack using the benzene nucleophile. That's going to do like this. So analogously to the electrophilic addition of bromine to an alkene, the difference is just that we made the leaving group bromine a much better leaving group by making it positively charged first. Once you do that, then you get to this stage where we have the arenium intermediate. That gets depronated by our, our MX4 anion. And I'm not really showing the process here. But overall, this is a little bit complicated and all sorts of pathways can happen. But the key point to the C is that when you have HMX4, that then turns into HX plus MX3. And so this is our catalyst that's reformed again, ready to start the reaction over with a second set of reactants. The fourth and fifth type of EAS reaction that we'll look at are similar to each other. And they're both considered friedel crafts type of reactions. The first one we'll talk about is the friedel crafts acylation, and this is used to create phenyl ketones, or viewed conversely, put a ketone onto an aromatic ring. So the simple example of that reaction would look like this. Uh, this reaction is almost always done with aluminum trichloride, and the electrophilic kind of starting piece is always going to be an acid chloride. So just looking at this product without trying to draw the mechanism, I should be able to see the structure of the electrophile, which is right here. And that is going to be something that looks like this, apparently. And that's going to be my electrophile. So I need to figure out how to make that. The mechanism for the electrophile formation looks like this. So again, we have a Lewis acid in aluminum trichloride. And so what we're going to form is the Lewis adduct. So here, the chlorine will attack the aluminum. That gets us to our Lewis adduct, which is right here. Uh, this is not actually the electrophile yet. Um, if you look at the structure that I showed you, there's a little bit of extra stuff here. This intermediate will actually tend to fall apart here and collapse to form a strange looking electrophile. Uh, this is called the acylium ion. So it is a carbon triple bonded to oxygen. That's another resonance form of what I drew up here. And of course, the aluminum tetrachloride anion as the byproduct here. This acylium ion, where the acyl refers to the CO group, is then able to react and get us to the final product here. 
So that was friedel crafts acylation, in which an acyl group or a carbonyl was added to the benzene ring. We can also do friedel crafts alkylations, in which an alkyl group is added to the benzene ring. So here's an example of that reaction. Uh, if you take benzene, react it with a chloroalkane in the presence of aluminum trichloride, um, you're going to get to the alkylated benzene ring. The problem with friedel crafts alkylation, however, is that it has a tendency to undergo carbocation rearrangements and also to over-alkylate. So, for example, if you run the friedel crafts alkylation of benzene um, with one chloropropane, what you'll actually get is a significant amount of this product and also a significant amount of doubly alkylated product. And that's very hard to avoid. We'll talk about this problem a little bit more in a future video. For now, let's look at the mechanism of the electrophile formation. Same type of process. We have a chlorine that can form a Lewis adduct with aluminum. That gets us to this stage, which can then fall apart. The leaving of that aluminum tetrachloride group gets us to a carbocation electrophile that we can then use to do our EAS reaction. One small thing to keep in the back of our minds is that for friedel crafts alkylations, it's not totally known that the carbocation is always the true identity of the intermediate. Um, there's a lot of sources that say that actually at this stage, this is the electrophile for this reaction. Um, for the purposes of this course, uh, the mechanism should be drawn this way, where we're going to form a carbocation intermediate first before we do the addition to the aromatic ring. So that was a look at the electrophile side of EAS reactions, and that allowed us to cover five different types of reactions in which five different types of groups are added to a benzene ring. In the next EAS video, we will look at how the structure of the nucleophile will affect how the EAS reaction takes place, and this will also expand our reach into non-benzene aromatic molecules as well.